268. Uh, now, uh, what you have here is basically an analysis and description of Luther's uh, attitude towards the politics of his time. And uh, some of this material uh, you uh, might find uh, relevant, other is not so relevant. We don't live in the 16th century, and our situation is dramatically different than the situation of Luther's time. But my claim is that many of the things he says uh, have implications for our time, and at least we ought to look at them with some care. Now, before I start discussing this material, I'd like you to have raise any questions that you have from reading it, because I really, I know what's in this material, I wrote it myself, and I'd be helped more if you picked up stuff that is of interest to you or that you find uh, uh, debatable and you want to talk about. It. So it's your your class and you you pick things that you find interesting and if you don't do much with it, I'll go right back to my lecture on Luther and then you'll read Luther again. I, I'll just reverse the procedure here so that we don't get completely out of whack. Do you have any any comments or questions? The first one is the political use of the law. Those of you who were at my lecture last uh, yesterday know that I talked a good deal about that from a different point of view. But, uh, uh, it's, uh, here you have all the, <laughs> all the footnotes to prove that what I said yesterday is really what Luther said. And then we have this chapter, Luther's Theology and Foreign Policy, and then this, uh, his attitude to its domestic politics, and then what is perhaps um, uh, particularly time-bound, Luther and the war against the Turks. Uh, you may be interested, since many of you are Lutheran Christians who are in it. I published that first in Church History in 1945. And uh, Louis Spitz's father, <laughs> who was, was the editor of the Concordia Monthly, <laughs> uh, wrote to me and said, Pharrell made me use it in the Concordia Monthly. And so that's where it appeared after it had first appeared in the, in the, uh, in, the in church history. Now, if you look at the date, uh, you will see why it was of interest. It appeared in 1945. That means that it appeared at the end of the Second World War. And uh, a lot of people uh, were upset Lutherans were upset about what uh, was the crusade mentality that had uh, uh, been so prevalent in America. You know, Americans have a very hard time fighting a war just because they're defending their country. It has to be somehow, must somehow be a crusade. And you know, the book that Eisenhower wrote about his war experience, he called, you know the title of it? You would know. What was the title of Eisenhower's book about his uh, war experience? Crusade in Europe. Crusade in Europe. And, and that's a dead giveaway. <laughs> that's a dead giveaway because we, because we have a terrible time saying uh, this is people of bomb Pearl Harbor and we are going to defend ourselves. That makes all kinds of sense. But we have to build up some kind of thing that we are fighting it for Christ and his cross. And, uh, and Luther, of course, rejects his own notion. Uh, if you read the article on, on, on the war against the Turks, it, it's perfectly right for the Germans to defend themselves against the Turks and they determine that is a perfectly legitimate undertaking. But if they say, we are fighting this war to protect the Holy Trinity, he says, the Holy Trinity can protect itself. <laughs> he says it in so many words. It, 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 in fact, he says, if the emperor says you should fight against the Lord, go. 
If the Pope says you must do it for Christ's sake, run this, it's, it's the very devil right behind you. I mean, it is, it is, it is this, the crusade mentality which he rejects, because for him the crusade mentality is again the confusion of law God's Yes, sir. I, I was a little surprised at his interpretation of the Daniel. Uh, yeah. Just uh, a matter of fact, in the chapters previously, how conservative he was in politics yeah. and in domestic and foreign relations, yet at the same time, how he would interpret Daniel. And I, I understood in the sense of the reading, but it was surprising. Well, you see, he has a, in, in that particular article, I point out that he, he, he has a big a strange notion that the Antichrist has a body and a, a spirit, and the spirit of the Antichrist is a pope, and the body of the Antichrist is a Turk. Uh, I consider that a fairly far-fetched exegesis by <laughs> 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 myself. But, but uh, as you know, uh, the only things that lose the road that you as Lutherans, and we as Lutherans, are bound by are the small catechism, the large catechism, the small count articles. Everything else is a theologian giving us advice, and we can take it or leave it alone. I mean, it is not confession. The confessions only use three of Luther's writings. Small catechism, large catechism, and uh, the small count articles. Uh, if Luther says stupid things, he's entitled to say it. You have the right to say stupid things. And why should he not be at the right? What, what, did Luther uh, postulate that uh, soul, body, uh, antichrist thing uh, just for the sake of uh, grabbing attention, or was that serious? He believed that. He believed that. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not questioning his sincerity. I'm just questioning his judgment. I mean, he, he, I, I think that, that the, the whole notion of the Pope as the Antichrist is, is a notion that I have all kinds of difficulties with. And, and in the, some of the stuff that we are reading now, he, 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 I mean, the, the, what we shall read a little later, the, the, the assignments in Luther, he, he, he wrestles with that. He, he wrestles with that especially, when, at first, you know, his, his, his whole orientation was against Rome, right? And, and then, when everybody else gets into the act, and you, if you have read the assignment for the day, then he begins to say, well, <laughs> we don't say everything that the Roman Catholics do is wrong. Not everything the Pope does is wrong. Some of these people, in fact, he says, some of these Schwärmer, you know, which is, he always translates as fanatic, which is one word. Schwärmer is a better word, but what can we, can we do? But, uh, that, uh, some of these people just uh, confuse the issue by uh, by uh, uh, by throwing out everything that we have. We got the Bible from 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 the church. Uh, we we got all kinds of things from it. We we cannot act as is everything that the, the, we got the sacraments from the church. And of course, he brings that up particularly. And I don't want to get ahead of my story. He brings it up in particular in relation to infant baptism. And there his argument is very interesting. Yes, he wants this. Then, based on what you just said, then was he against the whole the entire office of the Pope or just particular Pope's abusing that office? No, no, he was against the office of the Pope as a divine institution. There is nothing in the Bible to in, in, in institute the it's uh, the, the technical term is the papacy is jure humano by human right, and 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 Melanchthon says so much in the in 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 this little thing in the in the confessions about uh, about the the primacy of the, about the pope. Melanchthon, if the pope only claimed to be the uh, the first bishop among all the bishops. We can live with that. But when he says he is the vicar of Christ, who made him that? <laughs> I mean, even the claim that he's a successor of Peter is a little bit shaky, because we have no idea, we don't know whether Peter was ever in Rome, you know. That's only, that's only tradition. 
and uh, that, that he was the first period. And you know, some of the, the evidence that Luther brings to bear on this issue is, of course, that the most respected council of the church, where we got the Nicene Creed, the Council of Nicaea, the Pope wasn't there. The Bishop of Rome wasn't there. So you could have a council without the Pope. You know, so the notion of this, the, the problem, and, and, and if you want to talk about that in contemporary terms, I think many Lutherans would say, if we uh, have a ecumenical relationship to the Roman Catholic Church, there's no reason why the, the Bishop of Rome could not be the presiding bishop of all bishops. Euro Humano, by human right, if he claims to have this position from Christ, where is the evidence? Yes, sir. Uh, the, the Preterist view of uh, the uh, end time millennium uh, or the interpretation of the book of Revelation, uh, that was given a lot of credence at uh, that time and, and even up till, until now, actually, as I understand it. What, what, what well, you know, uh, when I was a kid, everybody thought, I mean, the people I associated with thought Hitler was the Antichrist. I mean, the, the Christians in Germany that, that uh, thought, thought that this was, people have always seen that, and there are, uh, Luther would have said, that to be the Antichrist, you have to claim to be the leader of Christians. And, and therefore, he thought the Pope uh, fit this description better than anybody else. Who the book of Revelation is talking about, if you ask me, then we should have brought to the New Testament class. If you ask me, I don't know whom the book of Revelation is talking about. You know, they talk about an antichrist, but who is that? Has he appeared yet? Is he yet to come? You know, you know what I'm talking about. But Luther was convinced, I mean, we're talking about Luther's theology. Luther was convinced that was the Pope. Not this individual Pope, but the papacy making the claim that they infallibly speak for Christ. That they are, have taken, that they can even overrule the scriptures. You know, that's the thing that, 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 that is particularly uh, objectionable to them. That they claim that they have the final word. In the Babylonian captivity of the church, which you haven't read yet, have you? Uh, that, that, there he deals with that at, at, at some length. It, it's this, it, it, it is this, this pretension that that they are above the scriptures, which he rejects. Yes. Does the Pope still hold that view today? That he is above the scriptures. He wouldn't say it that way for sure. Uh, the uh, the question is, does in fact the Roman Church ever once in a while make claims that would... Let me give you an example. The Immaculate Conception of Mary. You know that Mary was born without sin. The Pope has said that that is, is a dogma. That means it is necessary to believe that to be a Christian. He said that in the 19th century. He didn't discover it till then, but in the 19th <laughs> century, he, he made that into a dogma. Or, the infallibility, his infallibility. People and popes in Luther's time claimed infallibility, but the dogma of papal infallibility was proclaimed, you know what year? 1870 at the First Vatican Council. So it, 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 is, it, is these, it is these problems, you know, it is these problems that, or the, the uh, immaculate conception, the assumption of Mary, the assumption, we call it the assumption of Mary, that Mary didn't see death. What is that called? From the tradition, but there's nothing in the Bible about it. You see, it is, there are a number of dogmas, some of them 
Luther didn't, were not proclaimed at Luther's time, but in, in, in hearing, in the notion of papal infallibility is what one of my Roman Catholic friends has called creeping infallibility. <laughs> the, the, this notion that, he's not very much in favor of it, as this notion that this goes and goes. Some Roman Catholics will say, Roman Catholic theologians will say, the Pope has never made an infallible statement. Uh, in order to protect the notion of his infallibility, he never made it infallible. He is infallible, he never made an infallible statement. But, but, the, but, but in, in reality, there is a, a constant tendency to make these claims. Now, I just want to point out to you, just as you can't say Lutheran saint, you can't say Roman Catholic. <laughs> that means there is a vast variety of Roman Catholic positions. And, and, uh, and uh, they, they, the, whatever the Pope claims, he really doesn't have the, the uh, wherewithal to enforce that so that all Roman Catholics will say, because the Pope says it, I believe that. They should, but they don't. As you know, just to take one very obvious example, the practice of birth control is strictly against Roman Catholic teaching. All statistics show that Roman Catholics use birth control just like Protestants. There's no difference. No statistical difference. So obviously, the Pope does not Today, the Pope does not have that kind of power. But Luther didn't care. Luther might have agreed with the Pope on, uh, on that issue. But, but, but uh, uh, Luther had, uh, had felt that the notion that a human being can claim to speak infallibly for God is uh, a terrible case of hubris, of pride. And that's what makes him the Antichrist, that he puts himself into the place of Christ. And so it isn't uh, this particular man, uh, Pacelli or whatever his name is. It is the claim which Luther thought made him fit this description. Yes, sir. Did, did he write uh, in the office of the ministry um, where do the Lutherans, did he write specifically on the, the office of the pastor or the, the, Many public, the public ministry? Is there one writing in specific? And is it ever contradictory with the, the papacy and the, what the Catholic Church was doing? No, no uh, as you know, he talks about the ministry. In the stuff that we're going to read today, he talks about the ministry as one of the things that we got from the medieval church. And, and the ministry is one of the, these could like the sacrament. So he does, and by that he means, of course, the office of the keys. Although Luther expands it to the point that where when you are together with somebody who confesses to you and you are a baptized Christian and belong to the priesthood of all believers, if he confesses, you can declare absolution to that person in the name of Christ. Which is the main, is what Lutherans believe. Yes, yes. Uh, the reason that we restrict it ordinarily to the pastor is good order. It's for the sake of good order, not because inherently by the, the ordination that Luther believed in was baptism. So that he doesn't have a sacrament of order. We don't have a sacrament of ordination in the Lutheran Church. We have a right of ordination, but we don't have a sacrament. We only have two sacraments, and ordination is one of them. So, um, along with the absolution that could be granted by a fellow Christian, uh, Christians can earn, any Christian can baptize right. the same way. Right, right. right. And, and that he brings up too in this discussion, you know, with, with the, uh, in, uh, when, he, when he talks about that. I, I think I'm getting ahead of myself in, into stuff that is very important and we are, that I hope you all have read and I, uh, apparently you have any questions. Yes, yeah, some more questions. I'd like to have you discuss more about the, I like the way he separated the government yeah. and, and talked about. What page are you on? Uh, let's see, 
Insofar as they are sinners, Christians are subject to the law with all its restraining power, and everything that Luther has said about political use of law applies to Christians as well. It is true, of course, that Luther did occasionally suggest that no government would be necessary if all people were altogether Christian. I mean, that's sort of a theory that he has. <laughs> if people were all Christian, then we wouldn't need uh, the uh, government. But he never for a moment thinks that this is a situation that will ever prevail in history. So in history, in the, in the the world in which we live, uh, we are we are in need of government because government restrains evil doers. Um, well, he, at some point there, he talked about the fact that better to have a, a wise and fair um, head of government. That yeah, but because Christian. you see, government is essentially the application of law by reason. You want somebody in that position who has a certain amount of smarts. If that person is stupid, he may be a very nice person, but he messes up. And this is this is Luther's uh, notion that 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 being a Christian saves you, but it doesn't necessarily uh, make you make money on the stock market. The, the, you know, the, 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 he does not believe, and, and some people that are are uh, uh, not Christians are more wiser than Christians. Yes? I'm not sure if this is getting ahead of our, ourselves in the subject matter, but what did uh, Luther think of the Matthew 16, 16 Petrus, Petra? Uh, Utilization for yeah, that's the thing. He, he was con convinced that that referred to the the, the confession of people, you know, uh, uh, which he just has made. And this is the Petros, the the, the, the rock, uh, because next uh, uh, the next thing he says, get thee behind me, the Satan. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 when he when, when when Peter makes this statement, which he believes is really the devil speaking through Peter. So, so uh, Luther doesn't think that that is any statement about a particular individual, but it is a statement about the, the, the confession that Peter has just made, which is a rock. This confession is a rock on which the church is built, not on any person. Yes, sir. Um, could you just uh, give a little uh, explanation again of the difference between uh, Luther's notions of the two kingdoms. Yeah. Where I get a little problem here is, you give me the two kingdoms, and then to what extent does the political, you know, the civil kingdom, how does that fit in? The civil kingdom is this kingdom of the left hand. And, and, and in this kingdom of the left hand, God rules, but he doesn't rule with his gospel, but with the law. And therefore, Luther is suspicious when people try to use the gospel as, when they, when, like you know, all kinds of people will say, oh well, uh, a person, I mean, here's a guy who's murdered three times already, and they say, well, we are Christians, we ought to forgive him. You know? and Luther would say, you can go ahead and forgive him, but put him away from good. You know, <laughs> that, that, that means because like, you shouldn't do it anymore. I mean, the, the, the point is, uh, Luther has. Luther takes Paul very seriously. Remember, Paul says in Romans 12, do not resist evil. As Christians, we have no business being governed, Luther thinks. But, Romans 13, he says, the government is established to resist evil. That's why God has established the government. Now, for Paul, the Christians were not government. <laughs> The, the Christians were a despised minority persecuted by the government. But when, when Luther came along, the Christians were the government. And so the Christians were in this peculiar situation that the two kingdoms, as Christians, they had no right to use force. As uh, 
sheriffs <laughs> or as police or as uh, princes. They had the duty to use force. And if you do not, I mean, he's no Quaker. <laughs> if you do not use force, you uh, contribute to the destruction of human life. I see. And so conversely, as uh, Christians in the secular kingdom, civil yeah. kingdom, um, those Christians didn't have the right to use that kingdom for a holy war. No. That, that was his right. Right, right. Then they so, messed up again. Then right. they got it all confused right. again. And, 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 and of course, Christians in the, in the, in the heavenly kingdom don't have a right to do that right, either. Right, right, right. Isn't, isn't that right, true? Right, yes. So, I mean, I mean we, we, we don't, his position is not the jihad is ever permitted. No, he, he absolutely rejects the notion of the jihad. Yeah. He, he absolutely rejects the notion that we can ever accomplish God's purpose by violent means. And one other uh, question about these two kingdoms. The, uh, the, 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 the spiritual kingdom. Um, that is not just the future kingdom. No. That that is the here and now. And so it's it's right. But yeah. it but but, right. but, but it's now, now, are and, are, now and in the future. And the future. We have an anticipation of it now and he speaks quite eloquently about Holy Communion as his anticipation. Yes. Remember in Holy Communion we experience this fellowship, this communio, as he says, of all Christians, and that has direct results. We ought to now, love is the result, and we ought to be loving to all those people, and it also helps us, we, we have the assistance, not only of the people with whom we take communion, but with the entire heavenly community which is also participating through Jesus Christ with us in Holy Communion. So when you take Holy Communion, you're not only taking it with these people that are kneeling with you at, at, at the altar, but you're taking it with the whole Christian church, which celebrates this. Okay, that, 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 this, that makes some kind of sense. Yes, absolutely. This is a much different twist for me yeah. from the way I think I always grew yeah. up believing, uh, which was, you know, we are but strangers here. Yeah, yeah. Heaven is our home. Yeah. No, no, he doesn't want that. I, I was going to say yeah, that yeah. doesn't sound like a like a Lutheran concept uh, no, no, at all. No, no, no. Now, I, I, I wonder where this came from. Of course, you are re representing a position that's very common among Lutherans, and I think it comes out of Lutheran Pietism. Yeah, I see. Yeah, right. yeah it, it comes does, out yeah. of a notion that that uh, that the world is so evil right. that we. Might as well give up on the salt of the earth kind of stuff. <laughs> this is hopeless. And because it's hopeless, we shouldn't even try. While Luther really believed, while it was pretty tough, we should do our best. And my claim always has been, he did it, he tried it. He tried it from the beginning of his life to the end. He was constantly involved in this world at great personal cost. He probably died a couple of years earlier than he would have otherwise died by going to in the winter to Mansfeld to get these these counts straightened out. I mean, he was he was he believed Christians had a real obligation in this world, but not to save because only God can save, but to do justice, to show love. Uh, and, and, and that's what he was trying to do. Yes? Yeah, well, the same way his involvement always with politics, although he wasn't in politics, but he saw the importance of the involvement of Christians. But in, yes. And he believed that Christians ought to be involved. But as Christians, they wouldn't be involved in that self-righteous way, which he always suspected. You know, and we are right and you're wrong. They would be involved in the sense of trying to contribute Realizing that people came up with different answers in complicated situations. Yes. Uh, in his own time, both domestically and internationally, how much actual power did he have? Um, how, how much power did Luther? Yeah, how, how much power the did only he power he had was that he was uh, a very respected spokesperson for the church. 
And so all kinds of rulers, including people like Philip of Hesse, you know, the governor of uh, Hesse, of that province of Germany, and others, uh, his, his own elector, John, not the old one who had, had been the, when, when he, the Reformation started, this guy avoided carefully, Frederick the Wise, avoided carefully ever to meet him. He didn't want to have a guilt by association. He only communicated to Luther by means of Schwalatin and the, the Luther, uh, his chaplain, who was a friend of Luther, elector. But his nephew became a successor, John the uh, Constant, as he's known in, the, in, in history. This, this, this person asked Luther for advice. And all kinds of people asked Luther for advice, in, in, even in questions where his competence was limited. Uh, one of the tragic things that was the advice he gave to Philip of Hesse about his uh, bigamy. You, you, you know that story. Uh, that, that was uh, very bad advice, <laughs> which uh, cost Philip his job eventually. He was deposed as ruler of Hesse because he had broken the imperial law by getting married twice. And you can't. That's against. You can have as many affairs if you are a prince as you want. A thousand doesn't make any difference. But you can't marry twice. And, and, and this guy, Philip, had come to the conclusion that as a Christian he couldn't commit adultery. And he was married. So, um, but he didn't like the woman that they had made him marry. You know, that wasn't, he hadn't chosen her, they had chosen her for him. He couldn't stand her. And so uh, he had fallen in love with uh, another lady. And he said to Luther, I don't want to commit adultery. But I, 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 I am in love with this woman. What should I do? And Luther said, well, Abraham had two heads. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac had two heads. You know, he went through this whole business and said, uh, marry her. But don't tell it. Well, that A was not such hard advice, and B was impossible because the mother of this lady immediately told everybody that the prince had married her. You know? And so he had committed a crime. Because while adultery was not a crime in, under the law of the Holy Roman Empire, bigamy was a crime. And he had committed bigamy, and so when the emperor had the power, he deposed him for his bigamy. And that, everybody so far, was a perfectly fine uh, uh, ruling. Although the same emperor had girlfriends all over the empire, with whom he was not married. <laughs> yes, sir. You want to say something else? Yeah. Did the emperor um, dispose of because he was... He deposed him because he wanted a Catholic in that position and not a Lutheran, but he had to find a reason. And under the rules that had been established, that he was a Lutheran was no reason, but that he had committed bigamy. And so that's the way it works. Yes? There are quite a few, um, it seemed that Charles, you know, did mess with the Lutherans because of the, the power, so that the, the respect that they were getting as a, a growing they didn't mess with them because they thought they might need them for the church, right? Oh. So, yeah. yeah, but I, I mean, I, the, Luther gave advice uh, which was sometimes very good and sometimes not so good, and sometimes downright foolish. But uh, let anyone who has never given foolish advice to anybody speak up uh, <laughs> forever over this piece. I mean, the, the trouble is whatever Luther did got a lot of publicity. Uh, and uh, you asked what influence did he have? had an immense amount of influence on the people that, that believed that he had uh, given them, proclaimed to them the gospel. And these people, and, and Philip of Hesse was one of them, these people were uh, trusted him, which made it that much more dangerous when he gave bad advice. It's always a problem, but you see, you can see that in, in all human relationships, to the degree that you have influence on people, 
you can mislead people. And that didn't the last time that it happened in the 16th century. It happens all the time. <laughs> and therefore, especially when people trust you, you have to be very careful that you don't give them bad advice. Yes? I just, I, you cleared up the question again, but I was going to comment that um, the use of the law in government in this way preserves the gospel. It, it keeps the gospel straight. Right, right. And, and that, that's that terribly way. important so that the gospel is not made into a new law. You know, that's what Luther always worried about, that people would make the gospel the new law. And then we were in the same position as he was before he discovered it. Yeah. It's a very contemporary issue in the sense of the church's involvement in, in the political stance and how even the people in, in my experience, Lutheran parishes, want you to, to preach on political issues. And uh, but there was there was a reason. The distinction was that the church's purpose was, was the gospel. And, and if we lose that... Yeah. And, and, and I think you can say to your people, if you are a pastor, do get involved in politics. Mm -hmm. But there isn't such a thing as Christian politics or Christian economics. There is better and worse politics. But not. you can't say uh, the market system is Christian economics. There was a magazine many years ago that was called Christian Economics. And it said, you know, the free market and Adam Smith and this stuff is Christian economics. I know other people who say socialism is Christian economics. Luther would say there is no such thing as Christian economics. There's economics that works and economics that doesn't work. <laughs> and you have to, that's how you judge an economic system. You don't judge it on, on, on something. But it, it, the economics is never the gospel. And people are constantly wanting to make it that. You know, they constantly want you to say, God wants you to be a Democrat, or God wants you to be a Republican. And really, he doesn't. God wants you to be faithful. And I can imagine that somebody who wants to be faithful to God might end up a Democrat. And I believe that somebody who wants to be faithful to God might have, end up to be a Republican. I can believe that. I'll give you a, a, a switch on this. I do not believe that a person who believes that only white people should be in the Christian church can be a Christian. There are things that you can't do as a Christian. You can't divide the church according to race, for example. You can't say, God only loves white people, or he only loves Germans, or he only loves Norwegians, or something like that. If, if, you, if you say false things about the gospel, that's when you say false things about the gospel. And because you make the gospel restrictive. You make the gospel as something that, that is only, that is, is no longer, he is neither free nor slave, he is neither male nor he is neither Jew nor Greek. When you start doing that, then you're in trouble. But, but not because you have political views that I might find stupid, and or I have political views that you might find stupid. There is no no Christian politics. And I, as, I, I, I all can convince that Luther would have never liked Christian political parties. And you know, in Europe they have that. In Lutheran countries like Norway, they have a Christian political party. And I, I don't think Luther would have, have, have wanted that. And because it, it, it confused law and gospel. Yes? Do you think, do you think Luther's view on the two kingdoms, especially on the, on the law aspect, can be better? Do you think there's anything better? Or no, I don't know. You can try to tell me, but <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm 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 subject to better information. What I've seen is uh, what, what I've seen in in our setting is that the people that make Christian claims for their politics usually split the church. They divide the church on grounds that, on, on, I can, 
I, I, and that's what is a dangerous, dangerous thing. At the Lutheran World Federation meeting in Dar es Salaam, the Lutheran, I am the Lutheran World Federation, claimed that on the business of keeping uh, black people out of a church because they are black, that's a confessional status. And if you do that, you pay through those people out of the Lutheran World Federation. And of course, the lesson they had learned, and the people that pushed that mostly were Germans, the German Lutherans, and they had learned the lesson from the Nazis. You see, the Nazis forced the Christian church to get rid of pastors who had Jewish grandparents, who were, according to the law of, uh, of uh, uh, the Nuremberg laws, were Jews. If you had four Jewish grandparents, you were a Jew, even if you had been baptized as a baby according to this. And they said, we cannot have the church defined by race. And so, and, and that, that was this, and now when this came up in relationship to black people in, 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 in South Africa, there were a couple of German background churches that, that would not leave, let black people join. They said, if you don't let black people come into your church, you can't be a member of the Lutheran Federation. But they didn't do that on the basis of the law, they did that on the basis of the gospel. That the gospel is by definition for all people, and not only for one race, for one ethnic group. Yes? Well, Luther, it's definitely the separation of law and gospel as far as the government and so on. Is that where the church and state separation thing, or yes. all that? That's related to it, all related to it. But he used the term of the Zwei Reiche, the two kingdoms. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and he believed that God had established, and sometimes he calls it the left hand, which is the law, and the right hand, which is the gospel. He believed that God rules, but he rules all people through the kingdom of the left hand. And it's not, and, and, and therefore, a kingdom of the left hand, where the ruler, ruler may not be a Christian, may be a, if he is a, a reasonable person who obeys the law, this may be a good government. And that's why he said these ad admirable things about people in, 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 in Rome, you know, he, he admired the, the Roman government. He, he admired the fact that there was a government of law and not of men. And he thought that that was important. And, uh, and, and, and so he, but, that, but, but this is all, in, we are discussing here all the stuff that is in these articles that we have been talking about, not necessarily in the same sequence, yes? Do you have any personal views on the crusade? I believe the crusade is always, always wrong from a Christian point of view. And I think we have to get ourselves into a situation where we also make all political decisions, non-theological decisions, that we, I should vote for whoever I want to vote for in such a way that I can give you rational reasons why. I that means that, that this makes, and, and, and these reasons ought to be convincing even to people who are not Christians. They ought to be defended, to be defended on the basis of equity you know, and justice. I, I guess. We don't have to have faith in our government. We just have to be, it's got to be reasonable. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, faith, faith in the, I, I don't want to have faith in the government. Well, they're near the Then the moral aspect of uh, political concern would be linked to natural law? Right, to justice. The government is not supposed to make a Christian of it. The government is supposed to maintain law and order and, uh, and uh, justice. And you see, that's where we fall down, in my opinion. I mean, that's my criticism of our situation, if you ask me where, to, that, that, that I, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a scandal that people can walk uh, outside at night without being afraid to be murdered. That's just incredible that we tolerate that. But that's nothing with Christianity, it's nothing with basic justice. But, you know, they hang people in Egypt for stealing something.
thing, and we think they're barbaric because again they meet up just as according to the well, you know, the that, crime. We we could get now in a big discussion of, of, of capital punishment things like that. The main objection, in my opinion, that's not from Luther, of course, believed in capital punishment and for all kinds of things that he would think is unreasonable. But but the main objection to capital punishment, from my position, is that it is uh, dependent on how much money you have. The objection is not, in principle, I don't think that capital punishment is uh, unbiblical or against justice. If somebody murders people, he really forfeit the right to murder more. That's it. But, 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 if, but if you have a system in which if you have enough money, you can murder and get away with it. But if you are poor, you might not even have murdered, but the police picks you up because they need somebody, and you get the, 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 the then you have a problem. But the problem is not the death penalty. The problem is our system, which is so selected in enforcing the death penalty. You follow me? <laughs> it, it, the objection, if I were convinced that the death penalty would be fairly administered to people that are a danger to the survival of other people. I have no great objection. But that's not the way it is. And the way it is, I think, if you're poor and black, the chances of getting that down there are infinitely uh, better than if you are rich and white. I will be convinced if Mr. DuPont gets a death penalty, then you, I'll take it all back. This is getting a little uh, far afield, but several years ago I had the privilege of touring Wittenberg and, and you know, the Luther memorabilia there. What amazed me was that after 30-some years of communist rule in East Germany, that uh, what seemed to be a rather faithful presentation of at least Luther's uh, involvement in the secular life was presented to him. Uh, do you care to comment on that? Well, because he, the, 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 what whom did the East Germans have? If you were there during the time when they were still running the show, the, the only real big name they had was <laughs> Martin Luther, you know. And they wanted to make as much money with it as they possibly could. And they did. I mean, since they were communists, they were also interested in making money. The, this, the, the, this, the interest in Luther in East Germany was market driven. They restored the Bartburg, you, uh, they did a beautiful job in restoring the Bartburg. They did, did all kinds of things in Wittenberg and, and, and cleaned up all kinds, for the, for 83, you know, for the, for the 100th, uh, 500th anniversary of, of Luther's birth, they did all kinds of things. But much of this was done in order to bring tourists in. After all, you know, uh, Karl Marx was born in West Germany. <laughs> Karl Marx was born in Trier, and Luther was born in Wittenberg, in, in Eisleben. So they had one person that they could brag about. Yes, uh, Would this be an appropriate place to bring up the question I asked you last sure. night? Sure, why not? Uh, because I think it's somewhat related to this. Let's take it, because we're, we're touching on this question of the political use of the law. Right. Now we get into some politically touchy issues, uh, like homosexuality. And in, in, I'd like you to discuss that, if you would, in terms of what Luther's position might be, how we yeah. might see this, both from the well, two kingdom standpoint. But, but Luther's position would be very much like the Pope's position, very similar to that, because he believed that Sex and reproduction were profoundly interrelated. That you could have sex even though it might not be reproductive. I mean, but to have sex without any reproductive dimension to it, you know, to make it a form of entertainment that has nothing to do with having children in the family would make no sense. That was against everything that he thought he found in the Old and in the New Testament. It was not a quotation here and a quotation there. It was the notion 
that sex and family and reproduction are profoundly related. You see, what has changed so dramatically is that in the 20th century, thanks to the pill and other uh, means of uh, preventing uh, pregnancy, sex and reproduction have been divided, divided to a degree that most people in our country, I think, do not necessarily associate sex with reproduction and think of sex as a, a uh, activity, a pleasurable activity, which should be judged entirely on the basis of how much pleasure it gives to the people engaged in it. And they do not, uh, they do not bring the, no, they do not, the Pope always said, talks that, the way Luther would have talked in that, but, but you don't hear many people on the radio and the, on the television or in the media talk like that. Now, um, there was a writer, and there were Aldous Huxley, who 50 years ago probably, wrote a book called Brave New World. And in this book, Brave New World, he said, in the future, in this Brave New World that he described, children, now this guy writes in 15, in 1950, children would be raised in laboratories, in test tubes. And there would be some that would be raised without a little alcohol in the mixture, but the ones that should be laborers, they would put some alcohol in, so they would be too smart and wouldn't mind doing it. He didn't, Huxley didn't know about machines and computers as we do, but he, he, he's, but he totally, Brave New World was a place in which sex and reproduction were totally unrelated. He anticipated what, <laughs> this is what is so, so interesting about that novel, that he anticipated something that he couldn't really uh, see, but which we see now, in which, uh, for example, uh, people talk about marriage uh, without any consideration for reproduction. And uh, in the marriage service, as the Christian church had it for hundreds of years, be fruitful and multiply was always part of it. So, so you, you see what you have here is a development which uh, Luther could not anticipate. And so we have to try to resolve now on the basis of the gospel or on the basis of the law. Uh, my judgment is, and I said that on that television clip that they had on that movement of the ELCA sexuality statement. <laughs> I think the law ought to be involved in it. Uh, this I mean that uh, a rational approach to the issue, that you really think about it. What, what, are, you, what are you up to? What are you doing? What, what, what is the result of what you're promoting? And uh, since you are a psychiatrist, I will give you a chance to get back at me afterwards. But my claim is that the people that talk about this stuff, bring this down to me, the people that talk about this stuff act as if they were here. These are gay people. I will remove it later on so that nobody gets it. <laughs> <laughs> and here are straight. And, and everybody is either straight or he's gay. And I think this does not contribute one bit to a rational understanding of what's going on. Because I believe in reality there is a spectrum of people all along the way, probably not a bell-shaped curve, probably very much more in the direction of straight from all the, all the studies that we have done. But what this implies is that if 
people have the potential, and now they talk about bisexuality as, as an option. If they have the potential to either act gay or say, there are certainly people that are so straight that they, that, they, that they have goose pimples if somebody of the same sex touches them. And there are others uh, that are so gay that they have goose pimples than somebody uh, of the other sex. Right. There are such people, but I think they are the, by far the, uh, a very, very small minority. Most people, if you put them into certain situations, like in jail, will act homosexual in those situations. So it seems to be clear that we have a potential in this direction. If this is the case, and I will, I will uh, ask you whether this is the case. If this is the case, then of course, getting into a situation where you can persuade people in this direction would be unfortunate because this direction is the non-productive direction. That is a direction which is, without, if everybody did that, the human race would die out. You can't say that about these people. And therefore, you are, this, is, this is a position which has rationally, uh, it's a position that uh, you could not defend on the basis of the categorical imperative. Namely, if you act in such a manner that if everybody acted like that, it, it would be okay. If everybody acted like that, the human race would die out. Therefore, there is a natural bias in this direction, which uh, makes me, on the basis of law, uh, skeptical about any uh, situation in which people are put in a position of influence, influencing children and influencing people that would push them in that direction. You, you follow? You follow my, and, and, and for example, the, in my church, in the Evangelical Church in America, there, there is always this argument about ordination of, of homosexuals. And my claim is that it's a very bad idea. Now, I, you know, I'm 76 years old, and nobody can do anything to me, so I can go out and say <laughs> things like that. But I, but, but I know that there are all kinds of people that are afraid to say things. <coughs> But I, I'm honestly convinced that, that this is not a good situation, and therefore I do not want it. Not that homosexuals are more evil than any other people. You know, I believe that all people are evil. Right? That we are all sinners. It's not, homosexual is not the sin against the Holy, Holy Spirit. It's, but, and, 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 and Luther, would, you know, that he would have clear that, 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 that there is not any sinless behavior. But, but the, from a rational point of view, the present promotion, which I consider what's going on, promotion of homosexuality. The fact, for example, I'm very sad that people get AIDS. I think it's a terrible situation. And I have friends that died from it, so don't misunderstand me. But I, nobody wants to say AIDS is a totally preventable disease. You don't have to get AIDS. Today, when the blood the, the blood banks are clear, you know, where, where you don't have faith. Today, the only people that get AIDS are people that do certain things that, 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 that they wouldn't have. That's different from, from getting cancer, except lung cancer. <laughs> and they are good also. I think there are certain things, and you can't just say, uh, if somebody smokes three packs of cigarettes, poor guy, he gets lung cancer. Sure, he gets lung cancer, but it's certainly something to which he contributed. But you know, if, if what I say here, and if these, these people are, I'll probably take that tape away from you and burn it. You want me to stop it? <laughs> Good. Yeah, I think so. All right. <laughs> I think we'd be better off. <laughs> Jail for, for using the name of the Lord in the East. We used to have that, you know. Right. Yeah, we, but I don't want that. Yet it offends me when somebody on the outside yeah. would say that. Yeah, it, it, uh, I always attribute it to a, a limited vocabulary. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that means that people do that. But, but my, my, my claim is I consider certain, I'm offended by this. And I consider all kinds of things uh, uh, wrong from my own Christian point of view. 
but, uh, but I do not necessarily want to have a law, a secular law, to enforce things that, in my opinion, are uh, uh, peculiar insights that God has given Christians. Because, you see, even swearing, you have to really believe in God to make, to make swearing real. Okay. If, you, if you're an atheist, what are you swearing by? You, you know what I mean? Well, I, I, I'm not sure. For the, example, see, the issue, for example, of uh, abortion is an issue that, um, to me, the kingdom of the left will never understand because they don't understand the kingdom of the right. And yet, uh, you the see, issue I think of abortion is much simpler um, because abortion has something to do with killing. Right. And see, okay. killing is, is a, in, according to all the laws of all the people I have ever studied, killing innocent life is wrong. I mean, that, that's, that's universally it's wrong. Law. And I mean, natural law. Yeah, it's against natural law. It's universally wrong. Now, the reason that we have it is that people have talked themselves into the notion.